It's my pleasure to welcome to uh, this, this quarantine lecture session Father Basil Cole. Father Cole is a Dominican friar. He d has a license in sacred theology from the Solchoir in Paris and a doctorate from the uh, Angelicum, which is the Dominican University in Rome, and has been teaching here on our pontifical faculty for more than 20 years, I believe. So, Father Cole, uh, you are a uh, kind of an aficionado of Aquinas' teaching, and especially on angels and demons. I know that you've taught a course on that, so we'll be speaking today about this very interesting subject, angels and demons. So why don't we just jump right into it. Uh, tell us, well, what is an angel? An angel is a perfectly cra created being that's a, a, a spiritual, no matter, no matter what, no, <laughs> there's no material being in him. He's so no body. No body, no, no molecules, and that means that our knowledge of this is indirect. It's not direct. We don't know. We don't know from reason or from faith what it, what spiritual is. We know that it's not something material uh, with negative knowledge uh, and, and therefore analogical knowledge as well. So we've got a creature, billions of them we presume, judging from sacred scripture, who are uh, absolutely invisible to us unless God decides to have them appear as he did in the Old and the New Testament. And sometimes in the, uh, down the history of spirituality, some saints actually experience uh, something of their being. They take on a form of sorts, etc. Huh? Therefore, they are immaterial and perpetual. They'll exist forever. And they were created simultaneously according to the opinion, of the common opinion of the teaching of the church, not the, there's nothing dogm dogmatically, well, absolutely, created together with the cosmos. So they're part of the whole universe, the, 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 the spiritual side of the universe. And they were created by God, you might say, as a kind of a way of building up a hierarchy of created beings, starting with the, the least of material things, and then going up to human beings who are part spiritual, part physical, part bodily, and the rest. And then he wanted to create someone who was, persons who are completely spiritual as he is completely spiritual. And therefore, we can say that they are created more in the image and likeness of God than we are. So angels are pure spirits. Right. They're creatures created right. by God. Uh, they're very old. Immortal. Uh, you're saying it's... it's uh, <laughs> immortal. Uh, yeah, okay, so they're, they're immortal. Well, that's something that we should probably come back to, to talk about the angels and, and time. But they, they do, in a certain sense, have a, an, an origin, uh, right? So they're... Created. Would, would we Not say... Not made. Created. Yeah, okay, so they're, so they're created. Out of nothing. So these are creatures. Uh, okay, what, what is their function? Mm. I mean, what do we know about this? What we know is, we have to distinguish, of course, between the good angels and the bad angels, and they have different functions. But before the fall of, the, of, of some of the angels, we can say that, first of all, their function was simply to glorify God and to praise God. And there were ranks, a uh, hierarchy of these beings, uh, from the least to the greatest. And by the way, uh, that hierarchy is totally vertical. For uh, the lowest angel, there's nothing below him, and then all the other billions are above him, and then the highest seraphim has no one above him, and all the rest are beneath him. And within the various ranks, let's say there's a million seraphim and a million cherubim, we don't really know the absolute numbers. It's, a, it's all one is above, one is below, one is above, one is below. Primarily, they were there to worship and adore God. But God had other plans too, and that was to create humans. And so part of the plan for the angels, that some of them, that's where we get the word angel being sent, part of them were created for the cosmos. Uh, perhaps they have some relationship to the physical world. Uh, we don't absolutely know that, but the early philosophers, early early fathers of the third church 
seem to think that they were related to stars and moon and that kind of thing. And it's kind of difficult to know if that's really uh, what is revealed. Or you might be able to reason a little bit about it. But you can certainly say it's revealed that some of them were created for us and in, within the hierarchy. And we can also say that um, before the fall, uh, they were created in grace. Uh, that was that is the constant opinion and a uh, constant uh, certain teaching of the church. So when Saint Bonaventure came along in the 13th century, he argued that they were first created naturally, and then they had a test to see whether they'd become supernatural or not. Thomas Aquinas believed and taught, and I think today that's the most certain opinion that they were created in grace and that helps us understand something of the fall but anyway so how do we know these things about the angels i mean i suppose we would start really with the bible the only place we can know we we don't know at all from reason about the existence of the demons uh, we could probably reason a tad a little bit as plato apparently did that there might have been uh, individual persons that were not physical, uh, but that's, that's very loose, very difficult to, 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 to really prove so substantially. And so it had to come from Revelation as we find in the Old Testament as well in the New Testament. In the Old Testament we discover um, primarily good angels with an occasional exception. Um, especially with the, the, the temptation of Adam and Eve and, and under the form of a serpent. Um, and then in the New Testament, we discover a plethora of angels for individuals as well as the demons. And that the, the spiritual life is a battle that goes on in this life. That isn't that prominent in the Old Testament, nor do we find a a metaphysical analysis of what angels are, either in the Old or in the New Testament. It's just they, they do something. That's about it. Okay, so we, ha we have these mysterious figures. Sometimes in the Old Testament, we encounter them uh, seeming to be like human figures. Correct. Uh, and then they interact, and then we discover at the end that they're not human. That and is they're, that it's an angelic it's an angelic being. Okay, so what does that tell us about the about the angels. I mean, would that argue against the view of Thomas Aquinas, for example, that angels don't have bodies? You know, so we see angels talking in, you know, talking and interacting with Old Testament figures. But that's about the only way they can interact with people in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament. They have to kind of suggest that they're, you know, they're creatures. That's what makes it easier to think about them than God. They're created. God's not. He's uncreated. That's the first thing. Secondly, it would seem, following the fathers and others, that the, that the angels would occasionally appear with bodies to hint at the incarnation, that somehow God is going to become man. But that's only, those are only hints in retrospect. Okay? Also, the only way they could get things done uh, is to basically look physical. If they just spoke absolutely invisibly, that wouldn't be nearly as persuasive to get things done in terms of uh, the people of the Old Testament who were not intellectuals, who you know, lived a very primitive life. It's easier for them to understand. Uh, and, and we kind of have to say that these were miraculous interventions, not something that just simply happened, uh, happenstance. The, the, these were not their ordinary they, 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 they assume a body that looks like a body, but it's not a real body. Okay, so that's an important uh, issue. They assume a body, but they don't really have a body. They're not, so, they're not souls. Okay, so uh, can you explain a little bit then what, what exactly is an angel compared to like a soul? It, if, if you uh, die, I mean, some, because in the popular mentality, you sometimes will hear people say, oh, well, you know, if you die, you become an angel. Well, like me metaphorically, okay. metaphorically, you could say that because the, the soul is spiritual, but we're not pure spirits. Uh, we're not complete spirits. We're embodied spirits. Uh, the, the, our souls inform a body. We're, we're deeply connected to the material. The angel is not. And so that's why we can say that 
it looks like a body, may even act like a body, may use words, may even eat, as in the book of Tobit, but it's not a real body. It's a simulation, would be the best way I could think of it. Okay, now, and what's, what's the human soul by comparison? The human soul is a cause of life into a body that enables the human person to think, feel, and will. Um, because human beings are composites of these things. The angel has no, strictly speaking, feelings, passions. They can have spiritual joy, spiritual delight, but they can't have that physical delight. And that's what, you know, the soul also, uh, pardon me, the, yeah, the soul gets, gets specified as in, in, in its humanity through the body, through quantity, if you're a philosopher, but that takes us too far. Afield. Okay, so that's, this is an interesting point. You just said that angels don't have feelings like uh, the way we have feelings. Now, our feelings have something bodily in them. You know, there's a bodily dimension to being right. angry right. or to being sad or something like that. But would that mean that angels cannot, uh, for example, love or rejoice? They, they, in fact, are very personable to one another, and they uh, have, it would appear, since they have wills and intellects, and they are concerned about us, they can certainly, our guardian angel can, certainly has a certain affection for us, spiritually speaking, without any the bodily relationship. That's all we can say, because since if, if you maintain they don't have any matter and they don't have any bodily, uh, uh, bodily equipment, etc., they can still have a they can still uh, have a, a willful, a willful affection for us, and occasionally other things as well. Okay, so now a philosophical question: Aquinas would say that what distinguishes your soul from my soul is that your soul is the form of your body, my soul is the the form, the principle of life of my body. Uh, but angels, of course, if they don't have bodies. How are they different from each other? How, how, how can we distinguish them if they're pure spirits? The only way we can distinguish them is by the lights that they're given, the infused ideas, the, the, quali the, the, the intellects are absolutely unique and their wills. That's what seems to specify their distinction. We don't understand how that's, what that means, but it happens to be the case that in addition to their intellects, their pure, you know, they, 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 they are thinkers, absolutely, and, and lovers at the same time. Um, and what distinguishes them is the, that they all have different, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? They all have different capacities that distinguishes them radically so that we can say they're different species. But we don't, we don't understand the how. We can only kind of... We kind of so there's some distinction of form or some, some principle, uh, yeah. a rational distinction yes. between them that in, in terms of what yes. they are. Yes. Each one is yes. something slightly different. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. but, but, but it's but, slightly but, different not because they have different bodies, but no. different because their unique. constitution somehow is, is different. Each yeah. one is, is simply unique. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's, let's speak about uh, how angels exist in time or out of time because that's... That's a very interesting thing. Now you, you mentioned that they're, uh, that they're in a certain way eternal, but we, we would certainly want to distinguish them from God since God is their, is their source. Okay, so could you explain that? Yeah, they're eternal in the sense that they go on and exist forever. We would maybe better but you say immortal, if you wish. Uh, they participate in eternity, just as we do. We'll be existing forever, but we had a beginning. Since they are outside of time, uh, philosophers and the theologians would say that they live in eternity. If time is the measure of motion and they don't have physical motion, yet they, they, go, they do uh, think uh, in instance, using the word instance analogically here, and so that's a kind of a measure. Hmm? So, uh, therefore, they are outside of time, and yet they're able to see into our time by their intellects and by infused ideas, I should say, mostly infused ideas we've got. 
Okay, so let's just make this very practical. You have a guardian angel, we right. believe. I have a guardian angel. Okay, your guardian angel existed before you existed. Right. So you're saying existed in a certain way outside of time. Right. Uh, how does he relate to you if he is outside of time? Can he act in time? It would seem that if we believe that we have a guardian angel, we know, therefore, that he has the power to influence our bodies because he's above our bodies. Uh, and God has given him certain prerogatives to be able to persuade us through his causality. Um, he, can, he can persuade us through our imagination, memory, that can hopefully get us to think along certain directions and to make certain wise decisions. That's why in the theology of the guardian angels, he protects us from the evil one who also tries to do the same thing. And that's a power that has been given to him by God. Could God have not given him that power? Yeah, but he, he gave it to him. So well, that, that's the way it is. And we only, we know that from sacred scripture, of course, revelation, philosophically, it would take a little long time to go through how the, the spiritual can somehow have an effect on the material. So they are able in some way to affect our bodies, affect our lives. They can protect us from evil in some sense. What would that, what would that involve, do you think? You're guardian, you know, saying my guardian angel protected me from this danger. Well, the second, first of all, he can... Uh, influenced me away from physical dangers. Uh, if I'm caught in a flood or if I'm caught someplace else and I have to get out of it, he can influence my imagination and my memory to, to think of going in a particular direction. That will save me. That would be the first thing. He can actually interfere physically and take me away, which is miraculous. That's rare, very rare. Mm, he can also protect me from uh, falling into sin by making suggestions that I not go there. You know, again, oh, it's persuasive. I can still refuse. In fact, St. Thomas teaches quite clearly that when we get an actual grace from God, it comes to us through the angels. That's in the question 109 someplace. And uh, he can do that by reason of the fact that God inspires, God gives him the, the light to be able to do a thing like that. He strengthens our light. When people come to confession to me and complain about their kids, driving them nuts at home, whether they be teenagers or children who are acting up all the time and are getting upset, and they say, I always ask the question, well, how many people live in your house? And they will tell me all that, all, well, there's six of us, myself, my husband, and four children. And then I like to correct them, and I say, you're wrong. They're not six persons in your house, they're 12. You've got six others in your house, and those are angels. Pray to them. Uh, get them involved in your life, because they bring illumination, lights. They, they, they strengthen your ability to make more prudent decisions. They strengthen your ability to, to how to guide your household accordingly. They might even prevent you from getting into massive arguments with your husband or your wife and the like. They may make suggestions. Does that mean you live, you're living in perfection? No. But more often than not, they're more willing to help you than you're willing to ask them for help because God gave them to you precisely to aid you in the daily grind of your life, in marriage, single state, religious state, priestly life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that takes us off into the blue yonder of angels, guardian angels. Well, no, this is fascinating. So if we talk about uh, the way angels can uh, influence us, it also raises the question of how they mediate things from above and how they direct us to God. I mean, I think it seems to me that sometimes people are very interested in the subject of angels and sometimes in a way that's detached from God. You know, they, they get so fascinated by the idea of a spiritual creature that they forget that these angels are creatures of God and are meant, in a way, the good angels certainly, they're, they're helping us turn ourselves to Correct. God. Yes. What would you say along those lines for someone who might have a fascination with the angels? Well, if you take the three ranks, of the three hierarchies, the, the super hierarchies, the top three, they... Uh, can illuminate the next hierarchy 
um, that in turn uh, gives suggestions and uh, recommendations and commands to the lowest angels who take care of us, namely angels, archangels, and principalities. You see? And so there's a constant uh, give and take. And actually, angels can talk to one another. Uh, the principal way in which they talk is when the lower angels are given lights from above, strengthen, strengthen their lights for our, for our sake, okay? Not exclusively, but for our sake. And then the lower angels can ask questions of the higher angels as well, for our sake, and perhaps for their sake, but that's, that's in their own society. So they're part of the mystical body of Christ in a broad sense of the word. Christ is the head of the angels, Mary's the queen of the angels. And so that would mean, therefore, that when we love the Blessed Mother and ask her for favors, she also gets an angel involved, principally our guardian, but not exclusively. She might get some other angels involved in our lives as well. Because You said we each have a guardian angel, but Thomas Aquinas also and others would maintain that as priests we have a second angel that guards us. But that's, that's a pious opinion. Yeah. That's a beautiful opinion. Uh, so <laughs> how, how can angels be present in a particular place? Are they, could we say, well, my angel lives in this house, for example. What does that mean? He lives in this house, not physically, like the Blessed Sacrament lives in our chapel, but he sees us in God and perhaps sees us in it with an infused idea because he doesn't have eyes. <laughs> He's got something better than eyes. So infused ideas and in the vision of God. As, as all the saints that we pray to, see us in the vision of God, and God might give them an infused idea. I don't know. We haven't been to heaven yet. <laughs> so the angel is present in a certain way. Maybe now we should speak uh, a little bit about demons because uh, that's the kind of the negative side here of that's talking right. about spiritual yes. creatures. Right. And it's uh, figures that appear uh, clearly in the New Testament. Jesus is expelling demons. He's coming to, uh, to drive out their power from from our lives and to part free of, us from their dominion. Part of redemption. That's right. Okay, so uh, what are, are demons different from angels, or how, do you, how would you explain that? Metaf uh, philosophic. Metaphysically, they are the same uh, pure spirit. Okay? Um, unfortunately, they hate us and hate God because of a challenge that they were given by God uh, that they failed in that challenge. The, the challenge was to believe in God, to believe in God and to rely on God to bring them into heaven. They wanted to get into heaven their own way based upon their puffed up pride, using the word puffed up as a metaphor, but they could still have at this particular junction, they could still develop the sin of pride which is the diabolical, um, shall we say, the, the diabolical uh, vice. Uh, I will not serve. I will do it my way. I will not do it your way. And when they make a decision, it's absolute and total because they don't deduct principle. They got their knowledge is far superior to ours, all the angels, far, far beyond an instant, instant. When they make an instant evaluation and make an instant choice, it's forever. Totally. So that's, that's interesting. Let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, I, because as I understand at least Aquinas on this, he would say there is a kind of moment of choice at the beginning of an angel's existence in some sense. Now, beginning, it's beginning in quotes in because we're talking about outside of time. Outside of time. But, uh, but there's some, in some sense a beginning where they have a choice. And those who choose to turn towards God or to uh, accept the gift of of, of heaven, of heaven uh, are the good angels, and those who refuse are the demons. Right. Uh, okay, explain a little bit, what, what is that choice? Uh, I mean, what, how does that work? Well, there are various and sundry ideas on the subject. Let me just throw out one for now. Uh, you might say we discover something about their trial by looking at the trial of Adam and Eve, and looking at our own trials, too. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. So all of the angels, when they found out about the possibility of heaven instantaneously, they wanted to be like God too. But in order to be like God, they had to rely on God. They had to have 
confidence in God. They had to, have, they had to kind of give up their own strength, their own lights, and make an, a tremendous act of faith, whatever that meant psychologically or uh, in practice. I don't know. I wasn't there. But somehow they had to just sort of let go and humbly rely on God to bring them into heaven. And it just so happened that some of them chose not to do it that way. They wanted to be like God in their own way without dependency upon God, just as Adam and Eve wanted to know the knowledge of good and evil based upon uh, that temptation to eat of the tree, whatever that means, uh, etc. And so that's basically the trial they had. It was a trial of faith, hope, and charity, and they they blew it. They decided, no, we won't do it your way. We will not obey you. We will not serve you. We will not receive this gift from you. We want it on our own, on our own terms, which is, of course, pride for all of us to do it my way. So then what is, uh, what, why do demons bother with us? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. It's just simply from sacred scripture, we know that God let them have some kind of dominion on earth. That we know from the Council of Trent. And obviously in the New Testament, they have, there they are wandering around doing some terrible things physically as well as psychologically. And the best thing we can think of is, is that somehow God decided to leave the devil to have some influence in this particular world as to try us so that we can grow in virtue. And at the same time, while he lets them try us, he also gives us grace to overcome those trials. Though we don't always feel the grace, but even when we receive the grace, we sometimes resist the grace. That's the first thing. And then he also lets them have a certain dominion here on this earth that, that to kind of remind us that there is such a thing as a final judgment and a damnation. Because if you look at the New Testament, Christ speaks more about damnation and hell than he does of heaven. Hmm. And he does that through back to, you know, many times uh, in dealing with the demons and, and the rest of it. And so there's, there's an intimate relationship between your belief in the evil one and damnation. Uh, if you no longer believe in damnation, you rarely think of the demons. If you think too much of the demons, all you think about is damnation. You know? But it's a relative... It's a relative authority they have, an authority, a relative dominion they have in this life. And part of our understanding of the resurrection and the passion and the death of Christ is that you and I can fight these, you know, these persons and overcome them with his help. So let's think about how the demons work on us in particular. So uh, some people are very concerned about um, demonic possession or something like that or having... Uh, you know, a, a house that is right. infested right. with demons or something right. like that. But could you start maybe at the more basic level, like just our experience of temptation? What's right. the demons, how are the demons uh, at work there well, potentially? The, 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 the demons want us to fall into mortal sin. They want us to fall into venial sin as the road into grave sin. That's their job that they think they have. They want us to, to fall and to enter into their, into their mystical kingdom of evil. Um, and in doing so, like good angels, they, could, they try to attract us through the imagination, through the memory, and through the world, and through the, the, the culture, and through people, through bad examples, through the film, through the art, all, all, anything they can do to pull us away from the life of virtue. And that's very easily, uh, very easily done. The, the world, the flesh, and the evil, the devil, they kind of all roll into one as in seducers. That's one of his names. Divider is another name of the evil one, but that takes us too far afield, okay? So like the good angels, they can attract us and make us see that certain sins are in fact glamorous and glorious and good and fulfilling. That's what, they're, that's what they really want to do. But sometimes when people get involved in the occult, then they, they do other things of a more, um, 
upfront nature. They would prefer not to do that, it would appear. They would prefer that you and I not believe that they exist. But once they start to infest a house and, you know, knock and, and harm animals and do other things in a farm or what have you that's, that can't be explained naturally, they kind of give away their presence. Then when they also start to physically harm you, which is uh, oppression, uh, again, they're giving away something of their presence, which is, it, 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 it takes place because I've dealt with this. And then when they start to obs get you obsessing about, about yourself or about sin or about you know, crazy ideas, crazy insanities, which can, be, which can be explained on the psychiatric level, the psychological level, but it can also be explained by the evil one too especially when people go after Ouija boards, tarot cards, uh, uh, even porn, uh, even in a, uh, if you're in abortions, lots of times time that can happen. Uh, you talk to ex I've talked to exorcists and there are a lot of what they call portals into the dark side of our faith. You see? And when you stop praying, you stop going to mass, you stop going to confession, you open up again more portals for, for extraordinary phenomena to take place. Does it always happen extraordinary? No, but it seems to be happening more now than in past times. Then finally, there comes the point where some people think that they can get out of their mess by promising the devil to do certain things for them, and then they, they basically become possessed. Although sometimes that can happen without those steps, as, as exorcists will tell you. But that's a whole field of, of, of stuff that we need not go into. So very frightening stuff. Uh, what can we do to safeguard against that kind of demonic influence in our lives, practically speaking? Well, principally, prayer, devotion to Mary, holy water, uh, sacramentals, Statues, metals, scapulars, okay? Trying to, you know, trying to live the life of receiving our Lord in the sacraments when we can, or at least spiritually desiring the sacraments, etc. And then doing everything possible to, treat, to, to, to educate children not to go there into Ouija boards, not to go there into tarot cards, not to go there into looking for uh, your astrological signs and the fortune tellers and all of those things. However, in some cultures, there are people who throw curses and there are people who do some terrible things of, of a nature in putting it in, in, in the foods, etc. people eat, and then they, they're, they're somehow brought into the demonic. But that's, that's a whole other thing. Uh, and... I mean, is this something that Christians should be paying a lot of attention to in our lives now? I mean, practically speaking, is that a, a recommendation that you'd make to be uh, thinking about angels and demons? Is it better to just say, hey, look, let's just focus on Jesus and not worry about the angelic realm? Well, I would say it's important to think about the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation and the Blessed Mother and the saints and the good angels all together as a package, okay? Secondarily, or maybe thirdly, or down a little lower, uh, to at least remember that the devil does exist, uh, the evil one exists. After all, we say the Our Father, the last sentence, deliver us from evil, really means deliver us from the evil one. That's not my brilliant idea, it's in the catechism. That's one of the names of the devil. There are at least nine names of the devil. Uh, the devil, or devil and demon are used a hundred times in the New Testament, by the way. So not thinking about any of the, of the dark side is just as crazy as thinking too much. Um, but thinking of, and, and, and getting to understand more and more the Incarnation, the Blessed Trinity, the Blessed Mother, the, the saints, and all that's, that's infinitely more important. And praying to them, um, praising them, thanking them, uh, uh, adoring the Trinity, adoring Jesus, paying special reverence to the Blessed Mother through the rosary, etc., blessing ourselves with holy water at home now. We can't do it in churches for now for until this thing gets uh, ended, but the holy water is a very powerful sacramental. And, and having sacramentals in our homes is another way of keeping 
the, the influence of the evil one uh, away. So we have some questions from people who are watching at home. Craig Smith, coming to us through Zoom, asks this. What keeps more angels from falling now? If they're moral agents, why not a civil war tomorrow? The reason is the way they were created. They were all given the same trial. And the trial was a one-time affair. Uh, you either chose with, to be with God or you chose against him. And it was total, absolute, definitive, complete. It's over with. They made their choice. Two, God could create more angels if he wanted to, but it appears in the sacred tradition, in sacred scripture, that he made enough, or created a number of them. And he, he, did his, he did the angelic society, and that's it. Uh, we don't know how many, but we know it's not a few. We know that there's metaphors in the sacred scripture, over 10,000 of 100,000, and so that... That metaphorically could mean billions of them have already been created, all unique, all known personally by God. Uh, it could have been trillions. Don't know. But just multitudinous. Uh, that's enough. No need. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a very interesting issue about the, the angels and their relation to time, which we've already talked about a little bit. But the angel, what you're saying, is uh, in a certain way always, uh, always set on what he is eternally choosing. Mm. Would that be a, a, a that would correct be a way good to put way. it? Yes, he's, he's, yeah, he's completely so, immersed. Uh, and, and at the same time, can keep track of us because there's levels of consciousness in their intellect. But that's another question, philosophic. Okay, another question. This, from, this comes from Anselm Lefebvre, who's a, one of our TI students at the, at the University of Oregon, who asks, how, if at all, does an angel's power change when he falls? Well, First of all, he has to have permission from God to tempt us if he were a guardian. If he belonged to the higher ranks, uh, he, we don't know what he does, frankly. We don't know how, except maybe he might give evil advice to the lower ranks who, who tempt us. Though, exorcists will sometimes say that Satan himself has, has, has possessed people. So uh, those are... You know, hard to know, hard to know. Now, they can only tempt us insofar as they have permission from God to do evil, whereas the guardian and good angels have super permission to do all that they can to aid us and to guard us and to guide us 24-7. Uh, devils only on occasion, not totally. Now, St. Augustine taught that we each had two angels, a good and a bad, but, and, and I believe uh, Suarez held to that opinion, but nobody holds that anymore. So this is another question coming to us from Zoom. Mary Jackson asks, many people have strong opinions about naming your guardian angel or naming angels. So of course we know that some angels have names that are revealed to us in sacred scripture. Right. What would you say about assigning a name to your angel? Not a good idea, because it kind of implies that you're treating the angel as a pet or that you have something over him. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger himself once told us sometime, and I forget where, uh, either officially or in a talk he gave, that it's uh, not a good sign to name an angel because they're above us. They're not, they're not equals. And when you name someone, you're kind of putting your stamp onto them. And it's best to just simply speak to your angel as dear guardian. And if you look carefully at most of the official prayers approved by the church, they're only the Gabriel, Raphael, Michael, and guardians. And that's about it. Okay, another question. This comes from Stephen Terlizzi through Zoom. He asks, from the moment of their creation, did the angels have a beatific vision of God? And if so, how did the intellect of the fallen angels be swayed to choose not to serve? Okay. Well, in fact, they didn't have the beatific vision of God. That was the challenge. That was the offer. They could have that. 
in, after their first instant. That was they were offered. You can have the beatific vision if you depend upon me. See. They didn't have it then. They had the highest natural knowledge of God possible before they were offered the beatific vision. If they had had the beatific vision, there would be no bad angels. It's all over with. Uh, but they, uh, they, they didn't. Okay, so another question from Monique Murray, also through Zoom. Are the hierarchies flexible? Uh, so it, can an angel move from uh, one to another hierarchy? And are the demon hierarchies uh, definitely set? Well, it would appear from the teaching of the theologians that the hierarchy is set because um, the, the, the good angels is absolutely set because their beatific vision was in proportion to their knowledge. Whereas, by the way, if we get into heaven, which I hope we all will, we will be, get, be, get, be getting into heaven uh, in our rank, not according to how bright we were, but how much charity we had. Okay? And so once the choice is made, you're in a rank forever. Though that's true with the demons. You keep your rank because the, uh, hell doesn't destroy nature. So if you were a seraphim, you're a seraphim forever. If you're an, an, a, a guardian, you're a guardian forever, an evil guardian in this case. If you're a principality, you're an evil. You don't move. You stay where you are. So uh, Santiago Pinzon asks this. If angels were created outside of time and mm -hmm. exist eternally, right. and we each have a guardian angel, right. what happens when a person dies? Uh, so what happens to the guardian angel? Does he get reassigned in some sense? It appears from the tradition that his job is over with, as far as we know. Well, maybe he might have another job. Certainly he'll be there rejoicing with us, and maybe we will talk to him occasionally when we have our bodies back. Uh, you know, we might, maybe not even when, maybe as pure souls for a while, maybe we'll occasionally have a conversation. Uh, you know, but, but it would appear that each has a unique guardian angel, you know, and that's it. And if he fails, as it were, if somebody goes to damnation, you know, he doesn't go boohooing and crying. He did his work according to as best as he could, according to God's divine providence, etc. And uh, that's it, as far as we know. So is it, uh, another person is asking this, is it true that the closer you come to God, or the more holy you become, the more the demons will try to attack you? If God wants that to happen, it's not that simple. It, we might say, it might be more likely that that could happen, but not absolutely that that could happen. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of unknowns here. Uh, we could certainly say that as one is growing in the spiritual life and getting better and better, quite often there are more temptations and more attacks, yes. But does it always necessarily mean that uh, absolutely, I don't think so. Relatively, yes. I know that's getting, that's squirming a bit, but since I'm not a saint, I can't really answer the question very well. <laughs> okay, so uh, David Garcide asks uh, from YouTube, um, demons must surely know that only God can supply the knowledge they lack or, or in a way make them happy. Um, and so it would seem that to rebel against God is irrational. How can we explain that a purely rational being uh, is irrationally choosing to rebel? Because what God is offering is above reason, not contrary to reason, that requires an act of faith. Um, it's so even for the angel, an act of faith? Yeah, there's got to be an act of faith involved. Uh, and they had they had that faith, but they chose not to they chose not to to act on it. They chose to do it their way, as I said. Um, the uh, business of um, their choice, yes, they had total knowledge, etc. But but 
it's ne uh, the nature of God uh, uh, looking at it abstractly. This is beyond anything. That, that's, that was their challenge. We, it's hard for us to understand this, but for them, that was a really, that was a, like almost a heroic act to make for them, not for us. So we have another question here from Catherine Godlos Godlowski, uh, also from YouTube, asking about the screw tape letters, that book by C.S. Lewis. Oh, no, wonderful um, And so yeah. she asks, uh, what does Father Basil think of this somewhat comedic portrayal of demons? I haven't read it in years. It was funny then, and it's funny now. What's interesting, of course, is it humanizes them, makes them look ridiculous. Uh, it's the, the rhetoric kind of shows how manipulative they are to one another and therefore how they can manipulate us. And that's kind of, that's kind of a helpful hint that we, can, we are manipulatable by them, um, by, by the glamour of evil and the touch of evil. And yet to see how they you know, argue among themselves and come up with strategies, et cetera, it's, 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 it's unique. It's a, it's a classic in my eye. I, I loved it. I haven't read it in years and years and years, but I remember it. I remember learning a lot from it. Well, let's talk about that for a minute, about the way the angel, sorry, the bad angels, the demons mm -hmm. interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, are they, are they united as like a kind of uh, army against us? Or They're, are they divided among themselves? Well, or how would you say, analyze I, that? I would say that from the word, in, you know, the, the word uh, Satan means divider already. So we can say they're a confederation of evil and they hate one another and they hate us. And even as they hate us, they hate one another at the same time. It's a strange, a psychological phenomenon. It would appear from reason that they cannot get along among themselves, that they hate one another too. But at the same time, they work in the same hatred with the same goal of getting us to join their, their evil community, much like criminals who don't really trust one another. In this case, it's deeper than that, since they all experience the same hatred of God and therefore the hatred of one another. Hate God, hate you. And then just and, and in this hatred, you you kind of uh, since you have a certain dominion over others who could possibly escape from you, then you kind of work together. But you know, that's about the best answer I can think of. Off the so time. I've heard people talk about the mafia uh, as giving us a kind of analogy for demonic yeah. relationships. Like you get sucked into it, and then you get stuck in it, and then you you become like sort of a enslaved to it. They don't let you out. Um, but there is, like, within it a kind of joint purpose, but uh, also constant infighting and... Yeah, well, that makes sense. But, uh, but how that infight goes on, I don't know. Since okay, back, back to another uh, question. Um, is it true, that, so this is from uh, Thomas Sundaram, is it true that we can ask our guardian angel to lend us some of their intellectual light as a special favor? I would say it's not a special favor. Uh, I would say it's an ordinary favor. Um, it's the light that comes from God through them. And uh, I, I, they don't act independently of, of the triune God. They're, they're one with him. So when you're asking for a light from, from them, you're also asking God to give them that, 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 that light to, to enable us to do what we think we have to do. I wouldn't call this something extraordinary. Uh, so, uh, another very practical question. This comes from Peter Varga. If angels don't have bodies, can they hear us? Can they see us? Uh, or are they knowing us in some other way? Knowing us in a higher way through infused ideas, basically. Or as I said, knowing us into looking at... And, and because remember, the good angels, the least of the good angels, is totally wrapped up in God, primarily. And then there's another second level in, their, in his intellect. And if, he were, if the least angel happened to be my guardian angel, which I doubt, um, he might be, but I doubt it, um, uh, he can only know me through, he doesn't have eyes, he doesn't have ears, he doesn't need it. And he can know my thoughts, my imaginations, my memories. He knows what I'm, you know, where I am. He can't. 
he cannot, strictly speaking, uh, penetrate my intellect or my will. But he can kind of know what's going on. Karen Kublak asks, asks this, how do we distinguish whether uh, if we feel like we're, we're receiving some supernatural rev revelation, whether it's God speaking to us or an angel speaking to us. And she also asks, are there certain kinds of requests for help that we should direct to our guardian angels and different ones that we should request of God? The last question, not necessarily. This, you know, we all want supernatural goods. And when we ask an angel for a supernatural good, uh, we're asking God in a way because only God can give us supernatural gifts. The angels don't create grace. They don't create charisms. You know? They don't create grace. They, they're, they're bringers. And we bring them. And they bring our prayers to God. Okay. Well, that takes care of that part of the question. I forgot what was the... Uh, the other part was about, our, can we tell if, a, if an angel is speaking to us as opposed to God? Uh, probably most of us cannot. That's why if, if we think that's happening, if we think it might be, it's always good to check it out with a confessor because most of us are not that sensitive. We're kind of blind. And it could also be the case that the evil one can be talking to us. Uh, and that's what's so peculiar here. And, and, and sometimes, quite often when the angel does talk to us, we're not even aware of it when we get an idea that to do something. And we not, but when you start reflecting or getting reflex knowledge, it's a little dicey. It can be very difficult. And then, of course, there are, there are many ways in which we can be living in illusion and thinking it's the Holy Spirit, thinking it's the angels, thinking it's whoever. So another question from a viewer. How does Father Cole interpret the passage from the book of Genesis where Jacob wrestles with an angel? Well, the, they have to look at the purpose, and it's a, it's a, I'm not a scripture scholar, forgive me. This could be a literary illusion uh, for, for something that's important. And we could say that if, if it happened, the wrestling was of a, certainly of a physical nature, and it was meant in some way to bring Jacob closer to the supernatural. How that took place, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think anybody knows, except we can speculate. Okay? And the further we can, we can perhaps reason to the idea that in wrestling the angel, um, he's able to get to know the angel more and more. And that can help him later on if he starts to, to when he needs his help. If that's that's not a literary uh, device. And again, I'm out of my depth when I, I don't know that much from the point of view of exegesis that I should. That's, that's a poor answer, I know, but it's the best I can come up with. Well, we, we don't have too much time left, but let me ask you a question ab uh, about the Mass, uh, which uh, I've been asked frequently, actually, is that people will often say, well, uh, you know, the, the angels are present in a certain way at Mass. We would, we would have pious uh, representations of that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe in an altar you'd have carvings of angels or right. in right. a church, something like that. Uh, what would that mean to say that an angel is present at the Mass? Does the angel, uh, is the angel helped in a way by, by uh, the Mass being offered and so forth? Well, the Pope actually said the Blessed Mother is also present at every Mass. Why? Well, because in the Mass, it's not so much God coming down to us, but as He allowing us to kind of enter into heaven, not with the beatific vision, but to kind of be there with Him. And where there is Jesus, there is uh, heaven. Where there is heaven, there are the angels. There's the queen of the angels. There's St. Joseph. There's our favorite saint. There's our parents, perhaps. So in a certain, certain sense, uh, the Mass is an, as is an ascension of all of us because it becomes the body and blood of Christ as he is in heaven. So we're there in heaven but without the beatific vision. So it's in that sense the angels are there. Are we you know, giving them glory? 
maybe a little glory. Yeah. Uh, we're certainly giving glory to God, that's for sure, when we attend Mass. Uh, we're certainly glorifying the angels and the saints in some, in some way, especially the Blessed Virgin Mary, though. She's specifically mentioned in the Eucharistic prayer, and so are the apostles for that matter. That's about the best I can come up with. Well, there's a passage in the, uh, in the first Eucharistic prayer where we pray that your holy angel mm -hmm. will take this sacrifice to your altar on high. Right. Uh, what would you make of that? I've never, never uh, revolved my mind too much around that, uh, that era, but you know, speaking spontaneously, it certainly can refer to the idea that this is a holy sacrifice renewed, okay? And that if God wants to get one angel to represent all of us, fine. I don't have a problem. Maybe it is one angel. Maybe it's many. Yeah. Uh, it could be a metaphor for something deeper. Uh, that's as far as I can go on that because I've never studied that particular question a lot. Well, Father Basil, uh, before we, we're, we're just about out of time here. Before we go, is there anything, any other resources that you would recommend to our viewers if they want to do more reading or learn more on this? The best book that I can think of is Angels and Demons, sitting right here by Father Serge Thomas Bonino, OP. He's the, he's the rector, not the rector, he's the, the dean of the philosophy department in the Angelicum. But this is a fantastic book. Uh, on, on angels. It's a, they require a little extra thinking. I think it's published by the Catholic University of America. I use it as a textbook in my class together with St. Thomas Aquinas' things, which are also very helpful.